bits of baloney can cost you money. That's what P.T. Barnum meant when he said, there's a sucker born every minute. But it can be much more dangerous than that. And when governments and societies lose the capacity for critical thinking, the results can be catastrophic, however sympathetic we may be to those who have bought the baloney. In science, we may start with experimental results, data, observations, measurements, facts. We invent, if we can, a rich array of possible explanations and systematically confront each explanation with the facts. In the course of their training, scientists are equipped with a baloney detection kit. The kit is brought out as a matter of course whenever new ideas are offered for consideration. If the new idea survives examination by the tools in our kit, we grant it warm, although tentative, acceptance. If you're so inclined, if you don't want to buy baloney even when it's reassuring to do so, there are precautions that can be taken. There's a tried-and-true, consumer-tested method. What's in the kit? Tools for sceptical thinking. What sceptical thinking boils down to is the means to construct and to understand a reasoned argument and, especially important, to recognize a fallacious or fraudulent argument. The question is not whether we like the conclusion that emerges out of a train of reasoning, but whether the conclusion follows from the premise or starting point and whether that premise is true. Among the tools, one, wherever possible, there must be independent confirmation of the facts. Two, encourage substantive debate on the evidence by knowledgeable proponents of all points of view. 3. Arguments from authority carry little weight. Authorities have made mistakes in the past. They will do so again in the future. Perhaps a better way to say it is that in science there are no authorities. At most, there are experts. 4. Spin more than one hypothesis. If there's something to be explained, think of all the different ways in which it could be explained. Then think of tests by which you might systematically disprove each of the alternatives. What survives, the hypothesis that resists disproof in this Darwinian selection among multiple working hypotheses, has a much better chance of being the right answer than if you had simply run with the first idea that caught your fancy. 5. Try not to get overly attached to a hypothesis just because it's yours. It's only a way station in the pursuit of knowledge. Ask yourself why you like the idea. Compare it fairly with the alternatives. See if you can find reasons for rejecting it. If you don't, others will. 6. Quantify. If whatever it is you're explaining has some measure, some numerical quantity attached to it, you'll be much better able to discriminate among competing hypotheses. What is vague and qualitative is open to many explanations. Of course, there are truths to be sought in the many qualitative issues we are obliged to confront, but finding them is more challenging. 7. If there's a chain of argument, every link in the chain must work, including the premise, not just most of them. 8. Occam's Razor. This convenient rule of thumb urges us, when faced with two hypotheses that explain the data equally well, to choose the simpler. 9. Always ask whether the hypothesis can be, at least in principle, falsified. Propositions that are untestable, unfalsifiable, are not worth much. Consider the grand idea that our universe and everything in it is just an elementary particle, an electron, say, in a much bigger cosmos. But if we can never acquire information from outside our universe, is not the idea incapable of disproof? You must be able to check assertions out. Inveterate skeptics must be given the chance to follow your reasoning, to duplicate your experiments, and see if they get the same result. The reliance on carefully designed and controlled experiments is key, as I tried to stress earlier. We will not learn much from mere contemplation. It is tempting to rest content with the first candidate explanation we can think of. One is much better than none. But what happens if we can invent several? How do we decide among them? We don't. We let experiment do it. Francis Bacon provided the classic reason. Argumentation cannot suffice for the discovery of new work since the subtlety of nature is greater many times than the subtlety of argument. Control experiments are essential. If, for example, a new medicine is alleged to cure a disease 20% of the time, we must make sure that a control population, taking a dummy sugar pill, which as far as the subjects know might be the new drug, does not also experience spontaneous remission of the disease 20% of the time. Variables must be separated. Suppose you're seasick and given both an acupressure bracelet and 50 milligrams of meclizine. 
you find the unpleasantness vanishes. What did it? The bracelet or the pill? You can tell only if you take the one without the other, next time you're seasick. Now imagine that you're not so dedicated to science as to be willing to be seasick. Then you won't separate the variables. You'll take both remedies again. You've achieved the desired practical result. Further knowledge, you might say, is not worth the discomfort of attaining it. Often the experiment must be done double-blind, so that those hoping for a certain finding are not in the potentially compromising position of evaluating the results. In testing a new medicine, for example, you might want the physicians who determine which patient's symptoms are relieved not to know which patients have been given the new drug. The knowledge might influence their decision, even if only unconsciously. Instead, the list of those who experienced remission of symptoms can be compared with a list of those who got the new drug, each independently ascertained. Then you can determine what correlation exists. Or in conducting a police lineup or photo identification, the officer in charge should not know who the prime suspect is, so as not consciously or unconsciously to influence the witness. The American tobacco industry grosses some $50 billion per year. There is a statistical correlation between smoking and cancer, the tobacco industry admits, but not, they say, the causal relation. A logical fallacy, they imply, is being committed. What might this mean? Maybe people with hereditary propensities for cancer also have hereditary propensities to take addictive drugs. So cancer and smoking might be correlated, but the cancer would not be caused by the smoking. Increasingly far-fetched connections of this sort can be contrived. This is exactly one of the reasons science insists on control experiments. Suppose you paint the backs of large numbers of mice with cigarette tar, and also follow the health of large numbers of nearly identical mice that have not been painted. If the former get cancer and the latter do not, you can be pretty sure that the correlation is causal. Inhale tobacco smoke and the chance of getting cancer goes up. Don't inhale and the rate stays at the background level. Likewise for emphysema, bronchitis, and cardiovascular diseases. When the first work was published in the scientific literature in 1953, showing that the substances in cigarette smoke, when painted on the backs of rodents, produce malignancies, the response of the six major tobacco companies was to initiate a public relations campaign to impugn the research, sponsored by the Sloan Kettering Foundation. This is similar to what the DuPont Corporation did when the first research was published in 1974 showing that their Freon product attacks the protective ozone layer. There are many other examples. You might think that before they denounce unwelcome research findings, major corporations would devote their considerable resources to checking out the safety of the products they propose to manufacture. And if they missed something, if independent scientists suggest a hazard, why would the companies protest? Would they rather kill people than lose profits? If, in an uncertain world, an error must be made, shouldn't it be biased toward protecting customers and the public? And, incidentally, what do these cases say about the ability of the free enterprise system to police itself? Aren't these instances where at least some government intrusion is in the public interest? This is the end of cassette number one. This program is continued on side one of cassette number two.